They say that nobody's perfect, but we sure try to be sometimes, don't we? Is anybody here brave enough to admit that they're a little bit of a perfectionist? Like, things have to be done perfectly for you. It has to be absolutely flawless. Like, maybe for you, you're a perfectionist to the point that you have a really hard time letting other people do things for you. Like, maybe you never let your kids load the dishwasher because they don't put the dishes in the right spot, right? For me, when I load the dishwasher, spoons go in one slot, forks go in another slot, certain plates go on the top part of the dishwasher, other plates go on the bottom part of the dishwasher. And when Laura loads the dishwasher, she just throws it all in there. (laughs) Different spots, right? Maybe you're kind of a perfectionist like me in that way. Or maybe you're a perfectionist when it comes to laundry. You do not let your husband touch the laundry because he does not know how to fold the clothes. So you make sure all the clothes are folded perfectly. Or maybe for you, it's the lawn. No one else can mow the lawn because you and only you can make those lawn stripes look so perfect, right? Or maybe you are a perfectionist to the point that whenever you mess up, you're really hard on yourself. You beat yourself up for not doing it exactly how you wanted to, not doing it according to your own standards. If that's you, you just might be a perfectionist. Anybody brave enough to now after that admit, maybe I'm a perfectionist? I tend to be a perfectionist in some ways. But when I think of a perfectionist, I can't help but think of a guy by the name of John Wesley. Anybody here ever heard of John Wesley before? You, you maybe have heard of him before. He uh, was a pastor and theologian. He's most well known, though, for founding what we would call the Methodist movement. So if you ever see a Methodist church or a Wesleyan church, uh, these churches uh, kind of have their origin uh, by the teaching and theology of John Wesley. And as a pastor and as a theologian, Wesley believed in and taught something called Christian perfectionism. Or another word for it is complete sanctification. And uh, just as a little review, uh, sanctification is a fancy word that we use to describe Christian growth, right? When you are saved, you are justified by faith, but as you walk with Christ throughout the rest of your life, uh, Lord willing, you are being sanctified. You are growing in faith. You are uh, learning the ways of Christ. You are being gradually freed from the power of sin in your life. However, what Wesley believed and what he taught was complete sanctification, which is the idea that the, a Christian can eventually come to a point where their sanctification is complete, where they are perfected. In other words, they reach a point where they no longer consciously sin so as to be perfect in how they live out their faith. And what Wesley argued is that a mature Christian through years of spiritual growth could arrive at such a place where sin no longer controls their daily thoughts, their daily desires and passions. As he put it, the goal of the Christian life, namely uh, freedom from sin's power and an unswerving pursuit of holiness, was actually possible in the Christian life. As you can imagine, his teachings were, at the day, in his day and age, very controversial, and they are, still are controversial to this day. And though I'm definitely not in agreement with Wesley, my senior thesis in college was actually on this topic of Christian perfectionism. And as I studied Wesley, I, I kind of left it kind of feeling like, man, this guy was a little misunderstood. He got a lot of hate for this theology, for this belief. Uh, and, and people didn't really know, understand what he was trying to communicate. And I think a part of that is because I don't think Wesley himself fully knew <laughs> what he was trying to communicate, right? People would challenge him on something, and he'd say, well, it's not quite like this, and he nuanced it a little bit. Um, so I think he was a little misunderstood. 
But if you put all this aside, and even if you believe that Christian perfectionism is wrong and not a right theology, like I would argue, I do admire Wesley. Because he took something seriously that we all too often take for granted. Because as Christians, we hold firmly to the reality of grace, don't we? We should hold firmly to the reality of grace. We cling to it. We thank God for his abundant forgiveness and his love for us that no matter how many times we mess up, he will always forgive us. He will always, always show us grace. Grace is the air we breathe. Amen? We need it as Christians. But sometimes we fall into the trap of taking grace for granted. Taking grace for granted. As Paul uh, puts it, we continue to sin so that grace might abound, right? The more we sin, the more grace we have, and so we go about our merry way. But if you know anything about Paul, you know what he thinks of that idea. He thinks it's garbage. He thinks it's not good at all. Far, uh, far be it from me that we ever do that. We, but oftentimes we take grace for granted, which means we don't try to improve, we don't try to sin less, or try to live in a way that honors God, because we just know he's going to forgive us. But Wesley sought to consider and answer a question that I think more Christians could benefit from thinking about seriously. And that is, how serious are you about holiness? How serious are you about holiness? Do you really desire to be holy? You've been saved by Jesus, but do you really want to be more like Jesus? And if so, do you believe that God is able to make you holy? Because I think our pursuit of holiness, our pursuit of purity is directly related to our love for God. Do we love God so much that we want to be like him? To be holy in all areas of our lives as he himself is holy. Last week, if you were here, I mentioned uh, the devotional tool called the New City Catechism. And one of the questions they ask is, how do we glorify God? How do we glorify God in the Christian life? What is the simplest way that we actively follow after God? And here's how they answer it. They say, how can we glorify God? By loving him and by obeying his commands and law. How do we get serious about holiness? By loving God, by obeying him. Should bring us back to the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy in Luke 10, 27. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then Deuteronomy 11.1 says, You shall therefore love the Lord your God, and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. Glorifying God by loving him and obeying him, by actively pursuing holiness should be something that if you are a Christian, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it should be something that you take seriously. Again, we're not pursuing holiness because we're trying to earn God's favor. We're trying to get God to love us. We're trying to earn our way into heaven. That's not how it works. We are saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. But we pursue holiness not so that God could love us, but that we can demonstrate our love God. Now in 1 Peter chapter 1, I believe that Peter lays out for us the different areas in which we glorify God, the different areas in which we pursue holiness in our lives, in our minds, with our strength, and within our heart, in our soul. And this morning I want to look at each area, your, your mind, your strength, your heart and soul, And then I want to uh, uh, conclude it by looking at the holiness of God's word, which I think ties all this together. How does that sound? All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them with me to 1 Peter in the New Testament, 1 Peter 
chapter 1. Um, and just as a review from last week, we started a new series in the book of 1 Peter called Living Hope. 1 Peter is an epistle or a letter written by who? Peter. Nice job, guys. You got it. Peter is someone who, if, if you're familiar with the Gospels, if you're familiar with uh, what's written in the New Testament, had his great moments, but also had not so great moments. But as we see in the book of Acts, he emerges as one of the primary leaders in the early church. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit to lead the early church. And Peter is writing this letter to a group of Christians called the Dispersion, which are prim primarily Gentile Christians who have been scattered all through Asia Minor, all through what we would call modern-day Turkey, due to persecution. And the focus for this series comes from what Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, that we have been born again as Christians to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And last week, as we started our series, just as a review, we, we started by looking at two crucial questions that, that the first 12 verses of Peter lays out for us. And that, and that is this, that the first question is, how is Jesus our living hope? What is it about Jesus that makes him our living hope? And then secondly, if that's true, how do we, through Christ, live with hope? And again, as review, with the answers we found in the text were as follows, is that Jesus is our living hope because he gives us a new family. Therefore, we live with hope by standing out. Jesus gives us, secondly, a new life. Therefore, we stand firm. And then thirdly, Jesus gives us a new hope. Therefore, we stay faithful. So that's where we've been. And now we're going to look at the rest of chapter 1. And again, we're going to see this topic of holiness pop up in some key ways. Let's get into it together. Let's start in verse 13. Peter writes this. He says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the first area of holiness that Peter brings up is holiness in your mind. He says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace of our Lord. Prepare your minds. That phrase is literally translated as geared up the loins of your mind. Now remember that term? We talked about it on Mother's Day a little bit when we were looking at the book of Proverbs. You know, you might be, you might, maybe you've heard that term before, but for most of us, we don't use it in normal vocabulary, right? Like, oh, you better geared up your loins to do this job, right? It's not something we normally say. But back then, as a little bit of a review, a person would usually wear a long linen shirt that went either to their knees or to their ankles, which would be comfortable, except for when you needed to do something a little more strenuous. So what you would do is you would, as the illustration shows, geared up your loins to be prepared for what was to happen. You would tie your tunic around your waist so that you could move around more freely. And a modern-day equivalent to this is, is like the idea of rolling up your sleeves, right? If you're going to get dirty, if you're going to work hard, you'll roll up your sleeves. And so Peter is using this as a word picture for what should be happening in our minds. He's saying, roll up the sleeves of your mind. Get ready for action. Prepare your mind for holiness, because almost always, your pursuit of holiness begins with what, with what you allow to infiltrate and linger in your mind. I don't know about you, but I know for me, if I'm focusing on something or thinking about something that aren't uh, good, something that isn't good or profitable, and, and even something that's sinful, it's going to affect every area of my life. If my mind isn't in the right place, my heart is going to grow stale. If my mind isn't focusing on Christ, my actions are going to make that evident sooner or later. But how many of you know 
that each and every day you are tempted to put negative things into your mind. You see how great someone else's life is on social media, and so you begin to dwell on your own life and think about how lame your experience is, or you're tempted to wish like, look, look at them, look at her, and wish like, uh, that you could look like her, or look at him and wish that you had the things that he had, or that you could do the things that they, they do. And so you set your mind on discontentment, or you set your mind on envy. Or you enter into a conversation with someone who has some really juicy juicy gossip about someone else in town. And so you set your mind on putting that person down. Or you're tempted to set your mind on lustful thoughts by looking at someone else inappropriately or looking at explicit content on the internet. Friends, each and every day, the battle wages in our minds. And so we got to be prepared for action in our minds so that we, through Christ, can be ready to resist the temptation when it comes. We need to be sober-minded in that we aren't lazy or careless in what we allow to enter or take roots in our minds. As the Apostle uh, Paul writes in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and profitable, and perfect. As Christians, our transformation, our growth as believers, begins by renewing our minds. It involves testing the things that come into our minds to determine whether they are of God. And taking every thought captive so the good stays in and the bad stays out. Holiness begins in the mind. 